states that regulate charities are going to have fewer charities and things equal. Thank you for joining us for a new edition of the Perfectus podcast. My name is Gonzalo Schwartz, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Archbridge Institute, the home of Perfectus magazine. This podcast is part of our short series of conversations on the economics of human flourishing. At Archbridge, we define the economics of flourishing as the study of how markets, people, organizations, and institutions support the economic foundations of social mobility and human flourishing. And for this episode, I'm delighted to have Dr. Justin Kelly join us, talk about his work in a recent report we published at Archbridge on social mobility. Justin is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette and a research fellow with the Archbridge Institute. He completed uh, his PhD in agriculture and applied economics from Texas Tech University. And before that, graduated from Loyola University in New Orleans in his home state of Louisiana, where he was born and raised. Who that? Is that I'm supposed yeah, to say yeah. it? Who then? Yeah. Sorry, I'm Hispanic. I only know the original <laughs> football, not the uh, American type. <laughs> but that's a whole topic for a whole other podcast. Even though he just graduated uh, in 2022, Justin is thing is having at least, um, from my perspective, an amazing scholarly career with multiple journal publications on many topics from rule of law, political economy, economic freedom, and our very own field of uh, social mobility and economics of flourishing. And Justin is a lead author of our Social Mobility in the 50 States report, which is basically what we call our Social Mobility Index, which will be one of the main topics of our conversation today. Welcome, Justin. Gonzalo, thank you for having me on. Excellent. I wanted to start just by delving a bit deeper into what we call the economics of flourishing and how you think our Social Mobility Index and your work on it provides sort of a whole, a more holistic picture of social mobility, which is not just about measuring upward economic mobility, which is how it, it's done nowadays. So just give us a bird's eye view of it. Yes, yeah, so kind of taking a, a big picture view of it, the way I view economics of human flourishing or social mobility is sort of implicitly when we think about the American dream. And obviously it doesn't have to be an American ideal, but it could be, you know, it's, it's an ideal that people have all over the world. It's just the idea that you should have the ability to make your life as as great as you want it based on however you see fit, right? In a way that, you know, whether that means higher income, higher stability, you know, more work-life balance. I really think, I think that's one thing that we try to address in the social mobility index is looking at sort of this holistic approach as to how people can achieve what they see as their American dream. So when we think about, you know, what does that mean, right? It means something different for everybody else, right? People value different things. Obviously, you prefer more income to less, especially as you get up the income ladder. You might you might prefer other alternatives. Um, you might prefer, you know, slightly less income for more stability or maybe for a job that you like more or for the ability to work for yourself. Um, so it really is sort of this holistic approach of what do you see as your best route for the best life you want to live and how can that best be achieved? What are the rules? What are the institutions in place? What are the structures societally that are in place that can allow you to have that sort of freedom to do as you, as you want? Excellent. Thanks, Justin. Yes, I think it's a little bit, as as we discussed, we, I was discussing before and we discussed before in person that a lot of the research in this field is just about measuring if you out-earn your parents as adults. That's what upward income mobility is. And that's important. You want generations to improve throughout time. But I think the concept of it and just the, uh, as you were saying, the American dream, the, the aspiration behind what you, uh, hard work behind achieving your American dream, overcoming obstacles, all of that, you need to have that environment to flourish and to have more ability and to find your dreams. And that's something that we're trying to highlight with this index. Speaking of which, what are the four main categories of our index and subcategories that comprise them to go a little bit deeper into how we, how we structured it and how we built it? Right, yeah. So we first start with entrepreneurship and the environment for economic growth. It's basically the idea that Tyler Cowan has talked about and many others that show like we should have a stubborn attachment to economic growth. Economic growth, you know, you see a lot going on in discussions about degrowth. You know, degrowth can you know, lead to a better life, um, in part because, oh, we're saving the planet in terms of emissions. And that has been a lot, very skewed, in my view. In the, in the sense that you can't achieve both economic growth 
and lower emissions. So it's not like it's a, you have to choose one or the other. So we care about entrepreneurship and economic growth in part because one of the best ways that you can achieve your American dream, and we've seen people can achieve the American dream, is through entrepreneurship. And I think even people who care about entrepreneurship might get a little sort of, not confused, but they get a little stuck in thinking like, oh, it's great for the entrepreneur because they can, you know, work for themselves and they can do what, you know, they can put basically their life into their own hands, which obviously is true. I think there's a, an additional part of it that is sometimes missing, which is that entrepreneurship isn't just good for the entrepreneur. It's good for the employees who work for the entrepreneur, because obviously if those employees were better off somewhere else, they would work somewhere else. So it's better for the, you know, it's, it's improving the lives of those who they employ, and it's improving the lives of the customers that they serve. The idea is that in markets, the more competition you have, you can drive down prices, you can get more quantity, more access, which means more people have access to health care, um, food, um, despite what some senators might say, like a senator Elizabeth Warren, for example, um, said that we have a sandwich monopoly. Um, I don't know in what world that could possibly be true. Um, there's plenty of sandwich places uh, that are out there. Um, so it's good for con consumers as well because they have more options. You have also different types of quality. So right, you can go to a cheap sandwich place at, you know, a 7-Eleven and get, you know, an affordable sandwich, that is fine. Or you have the ability to get a nicer sandwich. It might be a little more expensive, but you have that choice, right? You have that freedom to choose sort of, again, kind of what's the route. So entrepreneurship isn't just good for the entrepreneur. It's good for its employers and it's good for the consumers because it gives them more options, more ability to choose. And that's one of the things we see is like as entrepreneurship increases, you see more labor flexibility is that people can then move around to jobs that best fit them. Again, like we mentioned earlier, that might mean more income. It also might mean more PTO. It might mean um, more flexibility. It might mean better paternity or paternity leave policies, right? The more firms you have and the more different ways, right? It's sort of, we think of like different states as like different laboratories of democracy. Well, different firms are different laboratories of firms and, and innovation. So you kind of, you know, you, you choose along all of these margins what you want best. So I think that focus is really important in part because entrepreneurship is one of the main drivers of economic growth. Studies have found that it can explain roughly a third to a half of differences in economic growth across countries, which is pretty much no other, there's very few um, indicators you can look at that's going to have that significant of a change in economic growth. Even things that we think matter and things that we measure later on, like education and skills development, right? Even that cannot explain the differences in economic growth as well as entrepreneurship. So we care about the amount of entrepreneurship, it's like business dynamism, and we care about the institutions that go into place that make an entrepreneurial environment dynamic or not. So we care about regulations that could be as simple as occupational licensing, that could be minimum wage laws, that could be um, state-level state, state level regulations, but it also can mean taxes, right? As you see, like, migration is that people move with their feet, and people are moving from higher tax states, like uh, uh, New York, California, and Louisiana, and they're moving to states that have low taxes, like Florida, Texas, and Georgia. So I think, you know, taxes, regulation, business dynamism, they all play their own roles, and they're very interconnected. So we wanted to sort of capture that as best as we could. For institutions and rule of law, the way I kind of maybe crudely think about it is it's the way that the state gets in the way of people in their everyday lives. So we think about how reliant uh, states are on collecting uh, revenue, not via taxes, but via fines and fees, which are typically disproportionately affecting the poor. If you think about something as simple as a speeding ticket, right, it's the same price no matter who's getting the ticket. Whether that's someone who's in a you know, very expensive Mercedes, you know, if they're going 20 over, that's the same ticket as someone going driving in a Toyota Camry. Well, the person who has, you know, on average, the person who has the next car has more income. So if you're relying a lot on those fees, you're punishing marginally the poorest worse because it's more expensive for them. Also, we think of corruption because you know, typically in some of the working research that I'm doing, with Jamie Pavlik at Texas Tech, um, shows that corruption is, you know, beneficial to the 
the rich and detrimental to the middle class specifically. It's the idea that corruption is basically, you know, it's not allowing people to flourish. It's redistributing otherwise productive money from middle class and poor people to the rich. And we think about the rule of law, because obviously in the U.S., we have this idea of a qual- you know, equal access to the law. But we know through you know, other studies that it's not exactly equal. Again, you know, the simplest example is that richer people can afford to have better lawyers, which is you know, just kind of already given, you know, that's just the basis of prices, right? In part, right, we want to have a good legal system that doesn't target the poor. So we try to measure that as best we can by looking at quality of legal systems and the state liability systems, access to justice, which is how, in reality, how easy does someone actually have access to good justice systems. So again, the states that tend to score low on these are the states that are have a more of a predatory state action environment, where they're more targeting people in a punitive way rather than trying to actually come up with a you know, system that is fair for everybody. Um, obviously, education matters. And education, again, so the whole index, we take this holistic approach. But even within these indicators, we, take, we try to take a holistic approach. So for education and skills development within different parts of schooling, so we look at you know, um, school quality from elementary and middle school. We look at school freedom and school you know, choice and the idea that more competition breeds better outcomes. It gives more laboratories of trying different things, see what works best for certain parents. I was uh, at a Pelican Institute event or a few weeks ago, and they had Doug du- uh, Governor Doug Ducey there. He was speaking on uh, a school in Arizona that they founded that was solely based for um, kids with autism. And it's a K-12 through education system that provides opportunities for a very niche audience that needs sort of extra um, attention and specific skill sets, right? They need teachers who know what are the best ways in order to work with these students to give them the best opportunities. But if you just put everyone in the same school, it's based on, you know, just where you grew up. Again, you're going to have the issues of the richest places are going to have the best schooling, poor places are going to have the worst schooling, and there's no ways to move around that unless you just happen to become richer. So we care about school choice, we care about school quality, and we care about universities and community colleges as well, because universities provide great opportunities for people to increase their incomes. But also, we care about community college, because that's a great way for a much cheaper alternative for people to earn a skill set and learn a trade that can help them without having to go into a lot of debt in order to do so. And then finally, to round it out, we care about family education in the sense of how well connected is the family and how involved are parents in their lives. Many of economists, most notably James Heckman, has shown that family formation and family stability matters a lot. So we care about how interactive parents are with their, with their kids in terms of sharing meals together, reading and doing homework together, you know, uh, going to your child's activities, as well as having a home life that is stable. While um, you know, many people might I don't necessarily disagree, but I think it's become sort of a, a maybe hot topic now. But it is just a fact that no matter, you know, what what the family environment is in terms of you know, even, you know, whatever, whatever the family environment looks like, it's better to have two parents in the household than to have one or none. Um, you know, that can explain not just children's outcomes in the, while they're kids, but also explains longer term outcomes is that people with more stable families tend to do better, not just in high school, but also mm-hmm. in their, you know, when they're adults. So again, we try to take a holistic approach there. And finally, social capital, which is the way that communities can be involved in either substituting or complementing government um, assistance, right? There's some ways, especially in the short term, if you fall on hard times, you want to have a community that can sort of support each other. So that's going to measure things like how connected society is in an area with one another. Mm. That's going to measure how well neighbors are sort of connected and doing favors for one another, as well as the regulations in place to have charities. Because states that regulate charities are going to have fewer charities, all things equal. Well, if they're going to have fewer charities, that means that there's, they're more reliant on government assistance 
which again is not, not necessarily a bad thing on its own because people need an ability to sort of, you know, when they fall in hard times to have that assistance to improve. But if you have charities, that provides another alternative. Again, it's, it's all about competition. It allows for more opportunities and more sort of specialized care. So whether that's, you know, for example, the church I go to has a food bank that you don't have to be a member of the church to go to, but it feeds everyone in the Lafayette area who needs it. And that those sort of, you know, those sort of secondary places for people to go to get access that is not just through government assistance provides an ability to both get connected with the community, you get involved with the people, you get to learn what their specific needs are so you can best improve them as opposed to how we tend to do government assistance programs at the federal and state level to where it's a one sort of, it's kind of a one solution fits all policy where it's really just about, oh, well, you, you know, you don't have, you don't have, you know, the enough money for housing, here's a housing subsidy. You don't have enough money for food, here's a food subsidy. Those things are great on their own, but they don't have the specialized attention that governments just don't have the ability to do, right? Because local communities know best what the needs of their communities are, right? The needs in Lafayette is different than the needs in Columbus, Ohio. In part, you know, something may be obvious, but like in the winter, right? The winter in Columbus, Ohio is presumably much more burdensome than the winters in Lafayette. So the needs of people are different in those areas. So communities are able to do that on a you know, lo- localized, specialized basis, much better than government assistance. So having those can, to be complementary or important because it gets people connected, which provides the ability for people to sort of get back into society and try to get better connected with one another. So again, the whole big picture is that it's a holistic approach to human flourishing, not just on the job side or on the education side or community side, but that all of these things matter. Yes, and as you said, it's, it's holistic. It goes through the different parts of the life cycle. It involves families and children, how they develop skills in their families in education, but then how when people learn those skills, how do they, what, what's out there in the labor market, how, do, how are they applying it, and how much opportunity they have to apply it. So I think it's a, it's a very complementary thing. So just to summarize, the four main um, sort of big categories that we're measuring are entrepreneurship and rule of law, sorry, entrepreneurship and economic growth, mm-hmm. rule of law and institutions, education and skills development, and social capital. Um, and I think... Uh, we view this first edition of the index as a proof of concept, and we would really like to encourage academic policy researchers, other stakeholders to provide feedback so we can improve it for future editions. And very importantly, we would like this to serve as a framework and a sort of scaffolding of how people can think about this more holistic vision of social mobility and how policymakers can improve on their local environments for social mobility, enabling better outcomes for the people, and, and even researchers just focusing on studying root causes and a wider array of topics related to mobility, as you just described, and not just focused on either taxes and redistribution, which is the main focus on the, of the field sometimes at the moment, or either measuring how much mobility we have or not, or then how much we should tax, because people relate, I think, mistakenly inequality too much to, to mobility when those are two different concepts. So they think to tax to reduce the gap, and then people have a better, easier chance to climb uh, the income ladder, but that just doesn't address the root causes or just redistribution, more welfare, and we definitely need a safety net. But how much of that also can create uh, dependency or other problems, or just it doesn't, it helps people come out of poverty, but it's not a sustainable long-term way to achieve, I think, social mobility. Um, one thing I think I would highlight, and in, in, maybe you would agree on, on this, is that many of the indicators that we've used, and you can go and check the report online, might not have a direct policy solution. So some people might say that we should include policy solutions for each one, we just focus on that. But for much of the research, and there's a lot of uh, research and work that needs to be done to improve mobility on an individual societal basis, which requires not just policy, but like agency, individual action, which is not something that's affected by policy too much. Or in many cases, it requires cultural changes or, or issues at the broader societal level that federal or local governments cannot provide, or in some cases shouldn't actually seek to provide, like when it comes to parental engagement, family structure questions, or issues related to social capital and community formation, how much of that do we need a policy solutions or, or it would be viable? I just don't think it's, it's, it's that straightforward. Some of the things are 
broader topics that we just want to highlight a wider array of of, of issues as, and topics as they relate to mobility that some of it would require just more agency from the part of people just taking action, overcoming any obstacles, or, or just dealing with personal individual things that, that the government uh, will not uh, will not be able to help people solve. Um, what are, and I don't know if you want to comment on that or not, but just maybe to link it to maybe one last question on uh, on this, uh, on the report. What are some of these sort of surprising and not so surprising results that you found in the report? Yes, I would say there's a few things I'll, I'll tie it into two broad categories. The first surprising, and this is one that I think me and you probably both heard from many people, is how low uh, two particular states were relative to, uh, relative to expectations. And that is Texas and Florida. And I think this is where sort of that, so for those who haven't read the report, one, I recommend checking it out. Um, but two, so Florida ranks 34th and Texas ranks 45th. And those were surprising to a lot of people, in part because people vote with their feet, right? And people are moving to these areas. And I think that is something where that I think um, I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about this on the platform, to sort of try to explain what's going on there so we can get a better picture. So, for example, let's start with Florida. I was looking at ranks 34th, which is, you know, higher than its bordering states. So compared to like Georgia and South Carolina and Alabama, um, it is, it is perform outperforming those areas, which I don't think would be too surprising to most people. But the thing in Florida is that they have certain tasks that they're really good on and certain tasks that they struggle on. So Florida and Texas, most I guess are the two states that stand out to me as ones that have such differing scores within the air, within the different um, subcategories. So in Florida, for example, you know, they rank 34th, but they rank fifth in entrepreneurship and economic growth. Why? Well, in part because taxes are low for them and they have a dynamic business environment where firms are moving to, people are moving to, and people want to live there. Um, however, at the same time, they score 40th on institutions and rule of law. So, right, so they're kind of like, in, for every category they score really well on, they score typically in the bottom 10 on others, in the sense of they don't necessarily have a predatory state, in a sense, but they have poor judicial system quality, where their access to justice is low and their reliability systems uh, do not, you know, stand up compared to many other uh, states. Uh, education and skills development is even within there, they score very drastically different. So, I believe they're they're in the top 15 for education and skills development, but they're first in education uh, quality and freedom because they've sort of been one of the torchbearers for school choice and having a quality education system, both at basically all levels. So they score well on um, basically elementary and middle school. They score well at the university level. They score well at the community college level. And they have a lot of good school choice policies. However, they also score in the bottom 10 in family engagement and stability. And then in social capital, they scored dead last out of any state, which to me was surprising in the sense that charity for them, you know, volunteering, charity regulations, a culmination of those show them dead last there. And even in community activities and neighbors, it's their 45th. Yeah. So I think there's, so I think the thing that maybe I would caution about people who, not that I, I think photos is necessarily doing a lot of things wrong, it's just again, it's a holistic picture. So there's a lot of things that they're doing that are really good, and have been have shown that you know, see improvements. Firms are moving there, people are moving there. They're doing a lot of good things, but they're struggling on some of the other indicators. Um, and that's kind of where that picture comes. On Texas, they score really well in certain areas, which I'm sure is not surprising to most people. Their business dynamism is in the top five, but they're. And their tax system's pretty good on certain margins. So they have really low income and corporate taxes. But for compared to a lot of states, they have really high property taxes. Which again, right, if, if housing is someone is usually someone's most expensive, usually their most expensive budget item is housing. Well, if property taxes are high, you're taxing a pretty substantial portion of people's income. Mm -hmm. And Texas itself is not that great on regulation. 
they have a lot of state regulations that are outdated and could really use some sort of sunset commission on having a sort of really good review process of, okay, re- you know, we don't put these regulations in and they just automatically are there until we take them out. But let's look at them every five years or so to see, are these really necessary? In part because innovation is happening so quickly that a lot of times when you regulate something, a few years later, that regulation is out to date and it doesn't really suit what's actually going on in those areas. Mm-hmm. Texas also seems to score pretty low on institutions in rural law and education and skills development. While they have high quality universities, they have terrible school choice policies. That's something I know our friend Vance Ginn has been talking a lot about, and Corey DeAngelis, obviously, um, has been talking a lot about. Of If Texas wants to be considered the free state, they need freedom on all these other margins. So they're already talking about things that I think me and you have tried to approach in this index. So I think on the, on the sort of what states scored worse than normal or what, worse than you would expect are those states. On the other hand, in our index, Utah scores number one, in part because they score high on almost every single subcategory. And that sort of stands out again as they're a state that has a holistic approach in, a, in addressing social mobility and income inequality problems. But what we'll note there is maybe perhaps surprising is that even states that score well, so for example, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, the, uh, the Dakotas, so even the states that score really well all have areas in which they can improve upon. So for example, in Utah, they score pretty low on state predatory action and pretty low on education cre- uh, quality and freedom. And this is something that in, on lane use regulation has been something that they've been struggling with, especially as a lot of people have moved to Salt Lake City and its other nearby areas. They're, mm-hmm. not, they're having a hard time keeping up with the housing, in part because they're not allowing the housing to actually take place. Even the policies that they have put in to try to address this have been what I'll call Band-Aids on a cannonball wound. It's, huh. uh, it's small marginal improvements, which are better than nothing, but again, it needs to be a more systematic approach to land use regulation that allows people to build. Because again, going back, to, not to repeat myself 10 times on this podcast, but competition. If you have more housing, you're going to drive down the price of housing. That's just an economic fact. So I think there's, you know, so the states that do well seem to tend to do well on a lot of different margins, but even the states that score really high have ways to improve yeah no exactly that's what i was going to say exactly the utah scoring first still has a long way to go on different things and, and it's and it's just as we said a framework for people state re- researchers at the state level policymakers can just look at the at all the different indicators all the different subcategories categories and see and say where we can we improve not to obviously just be better uh in our index not to have a, not to have a better score specifically, but just how can we enable a better environment for social mobility for our citizens? Um, so, yes, I think that that's always important. That there's always room for improvement. Um, and one thing I'll note on that is sure. places that also score really low on social capital tend to be places where people are moving out of. Mm. It's not perfect, but like yeah. Louisiana, California, New York, Illinois, mm. places that are all have seen some of the highest out migration rates in the entire country. Mm-hmm. They all score in social, score low in social capital, which I think leads to the idea that if people have to move to get opportunities, you're by definition breaking up communities. Yes, just by the nature of if you have to, if you you know if you if you're in a friend group and that's your close knit communities, in order for you to achieve your own American dream, you have to achieve it elsewhere. You're by definition removing the people in that community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that um, is maybe, you know, is something I haven't looked into too much. I think that's a potential avenue for future research for anyone out there is in what ways is out migration hurting communities? That's a, that's a great area, I think, to explore more. And that's so to skip into a question I wanted to ask you uh, in a little bit uh, to close us off. But before that, I want you to switch gears a little bit. And thank you for the summary of the report. I just want to go to to focus a little bit more uh, on your own work, and you've done very interesting scholarly work in different areas. 
And you've done a few studies linking uh, economic freedom to both income inequality and income mobility. So I was wondering if just more broadly about those fields, can you talk more about your work on that and what have you found that's been, that's been surprising or encouraging in some way? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I'm um, currently working, there's a working paper that was published at the Art Trade Institute with Vincent Gelosa and Alicia Plumings. And we look at how economic freedom within the United States at a metropolitan level impacts income mobility across, you know, all the metropolitan areas in the U.S. And what we find is, is a lot of the work has been focused on family formation and social capital. So Ross Chetty has done great work on measuring income inequality and linking social capital to income mobility. And what we wanted to show was, yes, that matters. Like we're not trying to, obviously, we go to the index. I think it matters. But we need, again, a holistic approach. So it's not just community involvement in social capital and how well people are connected. It's instead, it's more about, or as well as, it's about the institutions and the rules in place. So if you have places that have low regulations, low taxes, and a less burdensome government, they can displace otherwise productive private sector work. Those places tend to do better on income mobility. And what I find most interesting is our results rival, if not sometimes beat, the effects of different measures of social capital. So we find that economic freedom matters just as much, if not a little bit more, than social capital on some margins. Um, and in the fact that they're complementary in the sense of it's not yeah. like you have economic freedom and you lose social capital. The idea is you have both, right? Which again, isn't used to discredit Raj Chetty's work. It's then said, say, look, this matters, but this also matters, right? There's other things that matter here too. Oh, so that was one, you know, probably one of my favorite recent projects. Another one with Vincent Gelozo was that we looked at across the country's economic freedom and its impact on income mobility. And again, it's about the measuring of how well do your do kids outperform their parents. And what we find is that economic freedom, specifically low regulations and good legal system quality in terms of good judicial systems, equal protection under the law, and high property rights protections matters for income mobility. And again, those effects rival income inequality. Which again, I think is what people might get conflated is that they connect income inequality to any to mobility, but they're missing bigger pictures. What we find is that economic freedom matters much more than income inequality. And finally, a, a recently published paper with one of my professors at Texas Tech, Andrew Young, looked how economic freedom impacts incomes across the distribution. So we look at all 10 deciles as well as the top one in 5%. And what we find is that in economic freedom doesn't so in, in Vincent's work, we find that it, in, uh, economic freedom increases mobility, so you can move across the income distribution, but also those who are still in that income distribution still gain from economic freedom. So we see it as a rising tide that lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. And specifically, what we find is while everyone gains, the strongest winners from economic freedom are in the top twenty percent and in the bottom thirty percent. So you find that you know it's not just that the rich are benefiting from economic freedom. Everyone is, and even if we care about magnitude, it's the lower class that is benefiting even more than middle class. So it's especially important for the poor. Very, very interesting. And maybe focusing on that and connected to the previous, one of the previous answers, just to close us off, uh, what do you think are areas that scholars should consider working on related to this, or what areas are you working on next for your, for your own research? Yeah, so I think on the first part, there are some areas that I think are going to be interesting going forward is... What are some other things that matter for mobility, right? So we've touched, like, in part in part of our, in what we've looked at in the index and part of other research that I've done is that there's a lot of things that matter for mobility. So we want to wanna make sure that we're capturing them all. So I'm sure there's things out there that we haven't looked at. For example, something I mentioned earlier is in what ways does out-migration and the rules of the game that push people out of their areas hurt communities? Um, and similarly, in what ways when people move into areas that they're otherwise not from, does that help communities? Are there short-term potential negative effects, long-term gains? I mean, those are questions that are up in the air. I think haven't been satisfactorily, satisfactorily answered in the literature. At the same time, I think 
going back to why we consider entrepreneurs of economic growth, is there's been a lot of not just increasingly public intellectuals, but even increasingly academics who have talked about the degrowth movement. And I think it's probably one of the most dangerous, not to maybe you know, be too yeah. dramatic here, but I think it's one of the most dangerous ideas to have is that degrowth mm -hmm. is going to lead to somehow lead to prosperity and a better um, environment, both in terms of actual you know, environment, but also in terms of like a social and political environment. Every time when you see recessions, when you see prolonged levels of decreases in economic growth, you see an increase in violence and you see an increase in the loss of trust in society and you see a decrease in stability. And that's, you know, that's crucial for having a civil society, right? Like even just, you know, obviously economic growth leads to more incomes, which means people can better afford certain items which obviously all those things matter. But also at its core, right, civil society needs to be a part of the picture. And if you're having, these, if you're trying to actively push for degrowth policies, I think that's, again, some, one of the most dangerous things you could, you, you could do for society, especially areas that have not had the benefits yet of being middle-income or developed countries. So I think that's one area that I would like to see both my research and other research go. Um, me, also, me, Vincent, and Alicia have a working paper that we're finishing up on how uh, market liberalization impacts the environment, in part because we wanted yeah. to kind of directly take on this approach. And we were very ambivalent as to what the effects were going to look like. And we're like, look, there might be some environmental losses from market liberalization, right? As you produce more, you're oftentimes going to produce more emissions, right? That's sort of just the nature of it. What we found most interesting is if you provide the institutions for innovation, you can see economic growth without emissions. What we find, in fact, is that economic freedom generally has no effect on, the, on emissions, particularly in the 21st century, where there's been a lot more technological advancements that lead us to be able to produce without emitting, as well as even in some cases that we take the largest liberalizers during a time period, we find that those areas actually had a decrease in emissions. And the worst um, deliberalizer, Venezuela, which obviously went from being one of the richest countries in, in Latin America to the poorest socialist dystopian society that mm. it is today, tends to, you know, whenever they started taking on degrowth through these sort of socialist um, policies, they actually had a, a large increase in emissions, mm -hmm. in part because they became, they were already a oil-producing country, they became overly reliant on oil because once they kicked out every other industry because you didn't have institutions in place to allow it, they were solely dependent on oil. So obviously, oil is a big polluter. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're not allowing for any other industries to work and your sole source of income is oil, well, you're going to produce a lot more oil, and you're going to emit a lot more. So it's not as easy as you know many people in the degrowth movement might make it seem. So I think that's um, one area I think has, is important, not just for civil society, but also for income mobility. We find that in, the, in Vincent's paper, that it's not just economic freedom that matters, it's that channel through economic growth. As economic growth tends to benefit everybody, benefiting everybody, it's raising the standards of living, not just for the rich, but for everybody. Yes, and I think that's crucial and connected to your last point about the importance of that for developing countries. Uh, a great friend of our region of Perfect is uh, Magad Wade uh, from Senegal. She continuously advocates for more economic growth for Africa, which is one of the continents that still that still has shown a lot of promise that could be the future of the world with a younger population. And it still is not developing, but now we see pushes for um, other developed countries asking them, you know, waiting to not develop through uh, economic freedom, develop through aid or develop through, don't develop industries that will let you generate more economic growth and entrepreneurship because that might harm, your, might harm the environment. At the end of the day, if they engage in more reforms that are, make it easier to develop their own industries, make it easier to be entrepreneurs, to have more economic growth, the market liberalization even there will make it better for the long term. You can, they can if they're worried, if other developed countries are worried about the, the impacts of environmental 
um, issues now, but they don't let them develop. It's going to be even worse, as you said, in the case of Venezuela, it's a good case in point. But I think in Africa, it's very crucial that they engage in all this for developing quicker um, and for enabling more income mobility, enable more flourishing in that, uh, that amazing continent, I think. And I think my God, Wade is doing some great work uh, in that regard. And I think your work really connects to that. Uh, well, Absolutely. this has been she's, great. She's one of the best people there to talk about the issues in Africa. And yeah, she's, she's done great work. Exactly. Well, this has been really great, Justin. Thank you very much for a great conversation. And if our audience wants to learn more about social, the Social Mobility Report and our overall work, you can visit our webpage at archbridgeinstitute.org. And to follow Justin, you can see him, I think, in all social media platforms, mostly, yes, but on and Twitter. Yes, social media. Not TikTok. And in his, not TikTok, yeah. Not TikTok. <laughs> and yeah. On his, in his own webpage, Justin Kelly, C-A-L-L-A-I-S, justincalley.com. Uh, so thank you, Justin, and stay tuned, everyone, for more episodes in our Economics of Flourishing series. Thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Perfectus Podcast. It's been a pleasure to dive into the fascinating world of the economics of human flourishing with our esteemed guests. As we continue this series, we look forward to exploring more about how markets and institutions not only support, but also enhance our social mobility and overall well-being. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you don't miss an episode. And for more insights, be sure to visit us at the Archbridge Institute and check out Perfectus Magazine. We're excited to bring you more conversations that bridge the gap between economics and the pursuit of human flourishing. Thank you once again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.